Hello everyone, and thank you for coming back to yet another episode of The Gloving Paradigm. I am your host, Peter, aka LPD8 Dubuque, and this week is going to be a very interesting week because there's just been so much talk about it, and I've been rather hesitant on talking about this subject matter due to the fact that I have very minimal experience in this particular field in terms of gloving. However, I have plenty of experience elsewhere, so I am hoping that with my experience in other places it will help tie into this particular subject matter and actually help a lot of the newcomers pretty much understand where to start and how to understand the entirety of what I'm going to be talking about. So what is it that I'm going to be talking about? Well it's pretty simple. This episode is going to be kind of like a little introduction to the competitive scene. Now I will disclaim that yes I have very very minimal experience in the gloving competitive scene Due to the fact that gloving is not a competitive outlet for me, it is an expressive outlet, so you have to take my word with a grain of salt due to the fact that I just have very, very low experience in terms of competitive gloving. However, as my listeners are very aware that I am a huge Magic the Gathering player, it is my competitive outlet, so my competitive experience is due to Magic the Gathering as well as things like Smash Brothers when it was on the original 64 and things like Yu-Gi-Oh! way back in the day. So my experiences with competitive formats is very different to what gloving has to offer. However, there are things that I am very familiar with when it comes to the competitive gloving scene that it's not really hard for me to understand due to my previous experience. So. What I first want to cover is pretty much breaking down all the things that a lot of people should know when it comes to the competitive scene in terms of how the competition is ran and how the scorecards are pretty much tabulated and I'm going to break down how the scorecard is and what you need to know about it as well as go over a couple of differences between online competitions and in-person competitions, give you a few notes that I have on that and pretty much give you the pros and cons for both and then pretty much kind of help you figure out a good way to get into it. So to start things off in this episode, basically we're going to just go over how the competition format is set up and how it's ran. And then we're going to talk about the topic qualifications and so on and so forth so you guys can go from there. So first things first, how is it ran? Well, according to gloving.com slash IGL, you actually can download the boss handbook which will give you all the rules not only how to compete but also how to run a tournament if you're in the desire of actually hosting a tournament so first things first you gotta have to have 32 competitors at a minimum they all must be registered on the IGL network and that's the only way you're going to be able to get it sanctioned by amazing lights so just want to give you guys that heads up. If you're going to try to host one, you got to make sure that all your competitors are registered so they can be on the leaderboards. The other thing that a lot of people also need to know is that there has to be a minimum of eight judges to pretty much keep consistency throughout the judging process. Uh, the main reason why they have eight because they usually do f pretty much a flight of four groups, which is about eight competitors, and they have to have two judges on each flight per group basically. So you will have one judge judging two people as another judge is judging the same two people and pretty much the reason why that is is that way it's not anything in terms of bias it's to eliminate certain variables of variance in that sense. So you have that and then pretty much what you need to understand when it comes to online competitions is that it follows the same pattern uh, just different just pretty much a different medium. So the thing that you're going to need to know of how the tournament is run is that it will start with the Swiss rounds before it goes to a single elimination top eight. Okay, so what Swiss rounds is in terms of the Swiss format of tournaments is that you will be paired up randomly and then you will do your performances, then the scores will be tallied up and whoever wins in that one, pretty much all the winners will be paired up uh, randomly as all the losers will be paired up randomly and it will repeat that over and over again until you get through all the rounds. Typically when it comes to gloving competitions there's usually just three rounds because you only have 32 competitors. Uh, they haven't really set up any formats where you can have more than 32 besides 64 which is just pretty much doubling up what you're usually doing in terms of a competition. 
but they're not following in terms of what I'm experienced with where you can go to a tournament and thousands of people can be entered or a tournament as low as like 40 people can be entered, you know? So that's something that I just don't have experience when it's a hard set number like that, but it makes sense why to do it. It's just for time constraints and it makes it a lot easier. Not only that, you don't have to worry about any odd number situations where you have somebody who's an odd man out things of that nature. So that's something I would like you guys to keep in mind when it comes to how it's set up and why it's set up this way. Okay, so you have your Swiss rounds and everyone gets all their scores tabulated and then you have the top eight people basically become your top eight, which typically a tournament like this will take anywhere from four, maybe six hours at the most, depending on any uh, delays that might happen. Okay, so once you actually get to the top eight, you're going to have a single elimination round. Now, just to keep everybody in, in mind, when it comes to the Swiss rounds and pretty much the majority of the top eight, except for the top two round, which is the finals, your time is going to be 90 seconds or a minute 30 to do your performance. And that's very typical, and I feel like that's a very appropriate time slot to actually allow for competitors to actually really respond to their other you know to the competition and able to really wow the judges so once you get to the top two though it'll be two minutes even so just keep that in mind now one of the things that you do need to understand is once you actually understand how the format is now you need to understand how the scorecard is now there are three main categories that the scorecard has you have presentation execution and style those are your three main categories. Now, within these categories, there are subcategories and then pretty much all of them have three each. So when it comes to presentation, the things they're looking for is precision, complexity, and presence. Now, each of these subcategories have a set number of points that you can earn on them. So like precision, you can get up to four points on, right? And what they're looking for is how clean the moves and the concepts that you are performing then you got something like complexity, which is up to five points, and that's the level of dexterity, skill, or creativity that the Glover has in his performance. And then presence is three points, and basically your attention of the audience needs to be there. It's how well you can actually retain your attention of your audience throughout your performance. Okay, and then you have some then you have your next category, which is execution, and the Things that they're looking for are transitions, use of space, and pacing. Now, transitions uh, is up to four points, and they want to see how cleanly moving between each concept that the performer has. Use of space is three points, and that's pretty much just how well you use the depth of the space that you're in, and keep yourself within frame of your audience is another major one. Uh, and pacing is worth up to four points and that's pretty much your time and placing during the show in terms of following the tempo and following the pretty much how the music is directing everything okay and then you got style which the three subcategories in that is storytelling speed control and musicality so storytelling is worth up to four points which is a display of your beginning build up climax and ending and it has to be a very clean and coherent manner and then you have speed control, which is about three points, which is pretty much just tempo matching to the song, as well as catching all the different layers. Uh, and of course, musicality is worth five points, you know, pretty much just following the music, staying on beat, and hitting the multi layers of the song is pretty much what they're looking for in that. So if you add those up, it's pretty much 12 points each. So you can get up to a total of up to 36 points, excuse me, sorry. So that's pretty much how your scorecard is. You now know the three categories and the three subcategories that they're looking for and what a competitor should be focusing on when it comes to competitions is I know a lot of people are probably going to shoot me in the foot for this because I know a lot of people don't agree with me on this, but the scorecard is something that you need to be focusing on. It is what gets you to advance farther in the rounds. It also allows you to get up to the top eight. So when people tell you that you shouldn't be playing or shouldn't be gloving to the scorecard, I feel like that is a complete, complete wrong thing to say to somebody because that's what dictates whether if you advance or not. So telling somebody not to focus on what the scorecard has, you're not going to get very far. So when it comes to a competitive format, especially in my experience, 
is not of how flashy or creative you can be is how consistently and how quickly can you actually win in any given format so granted i can certainly agree that yes match gathering does not have any good translations into gloving in terms of the competitive scene however to me it's this it's the same thing in terms of the scorecard that you play when you play magic you know you got to get the number of wins in now granted that's not the same case when it comes to gloving because you're doing more of the scorecard now i can certainly tell you that you know things tend to happen as you progress through the tournament uh your fatigue is going to set in you're going to get tired and you know it's it's kind of a marathon thing and that's another thing that i have very high amounts of experience with is just playing tournaments for a very very long period of time i can remember a states tournament back in when i was playing magic really heavily in terms of the competitive scene that it went on all day it was just because we had hundreds of people there we had so many rounds i, I if i remember correctly we had like seven rounds and then we also had the top eight and that oh, it just took all day so granted this you're not going to have that kind of situation when it comes to the gloving competitions because usually it lasts about four to five hours six if they're actually really pushing it so focusing on what the scorecard has and focusing on when you're in the competition setting of trying to hit those points is actually a good thing okay you know and understanding it is going to help you focus on what the judges are looking for and that's something that you really want to pay attention to is you know really ask your judges what what are they looking for especially after a competition you definitely want to ask you know what what a lot of judges are looking for what really gets their attention so that way you can perform better in the competition capacity than previously here's one of the things that a lot of people have been talking about recently and that's you know the differences between online and in-person competitions i know a lot of people have been asking about whether or not if in-person competitions are actually dying off my opinion is that it kind of is and kind of isn't i i feel like it there is a level of staying power that keeps in-person competitions going especially in a regional capacity like if you look at colorado being you know one of the newest gloving meccas yeah, they're going to have competitions all the time and always have a good turnout. You know, Southern California is the same way. You know, Minnesota's, not Minnesota's, yeah, Minnesota is another one that tends to do a good amount. Uh, you know, you, so you have all these things that people need to understand when it comes to in person competitions and online competitions is that in person competitions are just kind of harder to run because you have to find a location that can hold that many people. Who are willing to allow a lot a huge amount of time between five to six hours it would be a good now buffer room just in case of any delays not only that you have to get 32 competitors who are all registered on igl to actually come out and compete and then you also have to make sure that it's sanctioned if you want it to be a sanctioned event you know so there there's complications when it comes to in-person competitions okay and I can totally understand that. And that's why I think online competitions are just so much more popular because they don't require as much effort on the tournament organizers part in terms of getting a location, getting things set up and things of that nature. I want to give a couple of notes and advices that I've learned about online competitions that I will certainly say I have never competed in an online competition before, but seeing as much as online competitions have been around so far, I have a pretty good idea of how it works. Okay, so one of the things I heard a lot of people who do a lot of online competitions like PM, um, yeah, PM Puppet is a great example of somebody who gives great advice about uh, the competitive scene. And one of the big things that he always tells people is always record a couple of videos for rounds in advance. That way you're taking less stress that you have to put on yourself to actually get these videos recorded and get them in good working. Some of the things that I will certainly say is a lot of the advice that people will give about recording shows in general is something that you want to apply when it comes to your competition videos because, you know, lighting and sound are absolutely crucial. And to me, if you want the judges to be able to see the complexity of your moves, you want to have a little bit of lighting so they can see your hands. Now, I'm not saying that your entire room has to be super bright, but you got to use some lighting that helps at least the people watching the video be able to see what you're doing much more clearly. And that's always been a very popular thing for a lot of people is just using a little bit of lighting to actually illuminate, show your hands a bit. And it also really helps with your camera's automatic settings. So it's not really 
focusing in and out of focus all the time during your shows. You know, now I can certainly understand when people are on a budget. I am some one of those pr- people that are always on a budget because that's just how I am. And I can understand that it's not really easy to go buy the big expensive camera to have like 4K HD. That's not ne- really needed to actually record a good video. Having a, just a very decent camera that doesn't have a lot of complications to it when it comes to actually recording, especially in low light settings that a lot of people do. You don't need the best top of the line equipment, you just need one that will service the job very well. You know, uh, my, my phone camera works just fine for me. You know, I it it's a Galaxy S8, so I feel like my camera is just adequate enough to capture what I'm trying to capture on my videos and perform the way I need to perform. So I'm not saying that you need to, but do not be using really, really old cameras who also have really, really bad audio sound on it. It just is not going to translate well for you at all in terms of your performance. And that's something I think judges might actually knock you on is bad recording equipment. Now, I haven't heard any official statements about that in terms of online competitions, but it's something that I always kept in the back of my mind if I ever wanted to compete. So that's just something I always want to let newcomers understand is that you don't need the best equipment. You just need a good equipment and not one that is going to cost you an arm and a leg in order for you to compete. Okay. So another good point of advice is record it in a comfortable space. Now, I will certainly say when it comes to like keeping in frame and stuff, this is where I see a lot of people do some interesting tricks like recording in a hallway to naturally put them in a frame of a point of frame that allows them to maintain that center of frame. Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to do this. It's if that's something that works for you, fantastic. Definitely go ahead and do that. Uh, but to me, I would tell people just to find a space that they feel most comfortable in and record there. Now, of course, that's also barring that you don't have any audio interference or anything like that that's going to really affect the sound quality of your show. However, that's just something I always try to expand on people. Now, there are a few pros and cons when it comes to online and in person, and pretty much you can take the pros and the cons and flip them when it comes to online and competitive. So I'm gonna actually cover the online first, which, you know, the pros is pretty simple. One is being comfortability. You know, the whole idea that you're not really having to leave your house, you have this bigger sense of comfort and being able to not feel so pressured, right? And that's the other point is being feeling less pressure, especially if you record a few uh, few shows before the competition starts, you actually have a few rounds under your belt. And if you do that, then you're not being so pressured to actually get on to doing uh, the competition. Now, another huge thing that I don't think a lot of people take into consideration is more control. And what I mean by more control is that since you have more control of where you are and what you listen to and how you perform, you don't feel that much pressure of having so many eyeballs on you. Now, I can certainly understand when people get a little camera shy because they're sitting there thinking that thousands of people are going to be watching this video. That's something that I always want to tell people to just put that out of your mind, okay? When, When it comes down to it, and especially when it just comes to recording in general, especially if you're doing it for a competition, you're just in a room with the camera and there's nobody else. Yes, people are going to be seeing these videos, but they're going to be seeing this video after you record it. So, you know, stressing yourself out about people watching what you're going to be recording is not helping you perform very well. You're kind of psyching yourself out. So when it comes to just recording in general, you just got to sit there and think, you know what? It's me by myself in front of a camera. Okay, that way you're you're giving you're taking away the illusion that there's going to be thousands of people watching you and you're having that thought process in your mind when you're actually performing. So it's just something that I always tell people is that when when it comes to that camera shyness, just kind of remind yourself that you're just you in a room with the camera. You know, you don't have anyone kind of doing a backseat gloving deal behind you, you know, telling you that you should do more cutting or whatnot, you know. So those those are pretty much the huge pros for me when it comes to online. Now, some of the cons that I have about online is that it's much slower in terms of time constraints. You know, you you have like two judges and an organizer and you have to send all these videos into these people and then they have to watch all of them and then score and tabulate and then move on from there. Usually each round takes about a week just because (laughs) 
as everyone tends to forget, people have lives outside of these areas. So, you know, you got to be a little bit more lenient on that. Okay. Uh, one major thing that I have a problem when it comes to online competitions is that there's that, at least to me, this is what I find very important about gloving is there's that lack of social aspect where, you know, you're not having the competitors meet each other and they actually have that opportunity to actually talk and learn from each other and get to know each other. That, that to me is one of the big things for me about competition altogether is that there's that social aspect. You know, you meet the other competitors, you can feel the competitive spirit, you, you know, you get the good sportsmanship going on, you know, and you can have this whole social network between everybody afterwards. You know, that's something I feel you get robbed from when it comes to online competitions. Now, I'm not saying that online competitions are horribly bad because of it. That's just to me is almost borderline a deal breaker. And it's just because that's what I want out of competitions is that social aspect where I can, you know, sit there, have a battle with an opponent. And then after that, I can just talk to my opponent and actually have a conversation. Not only that, it gives me the opportunity to learn and think of new ways and all that stuff. So some people like the online competition because they don't have to talk to anyone. I just feel like you're being, you're robbing yourself of a, an amazing experience that you may never had before and actually would enjoy it. Like that's just some of the things that I love about competitions altogether or any tournaments is that there's that social aspect that you just don't really get anywhere else because you're hanging out with people who are very much like-minded like you, who have the same passions as you of whatever the competition is. And you know, that's, that's how it works for me. And what kind of segues into that is the lack of stakes feeling. Now I can certainly understand that some people are going to probably disagree with me, but like, well, there is stakes on the line, which I do agree, but you don't feel the level of tension when you're in like an in-person competition. Now I can understand if there are people out there who don't like that feeling of pressure when it comes to an audience who, you know, who's crowded around them and they're trying to do their best and they just feel the pressure from everybody around them. Totally understandable. You know, I would certainly agree. I don't like put, being put on the spot like that as well, because, you know, it's just more social pressures that I have to be aware of that I don't want to have to worry about. But, you know, that's tends to happen when you're doing really, 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 really well in competition is that you're going to get spotlighted and it's not necessarily a bad thing because you're getting your name out there, you're getting your image out there and stuff like that. Uh, I can understand how people just, you know, the anxiety is going to get to them on that. I can totally feel how you are. Now, when it comes to in-person competitions, one of the big, uh, major pros is, you know, the social aspect is the biggest one for me. Uh, it's much faster because you're doing it within a matter of hours instead of a matter of weeks. The, the stakes feel much higher and to me I actually kind of like a little bit of that tension where the stakes are much higher because it's instead of letting it be a fear for me it's a motivation to me to do better because that's how competitions are supposed to feel you're supposed to feel these these tensions where you're just like you gotta do you know push yourself really really hard to actually get those results and if I don't feel that I feel like I'm being robbed of the motivation that I need to push myself even harder. I don't feel the need to put, get my game up type deal, you know, and that's just personally me. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but that's just something I, I feel is necessary for competition because you, that, that stakes feeling gives me that driving force. And I know a lot of people who are like that myself, who really like that feeling that, you know, they get that pressure of, you know, there's so much on the line and to me, that's just a good motivation for you to push yourself to be better. You know, one of the major cons about, I at least from what I have noticed with in-person competitions is the travel. Probably the biggest con ever is the expenses of travel. Now I can certainly tell you from what I've read with the prize support that Amazing Lights will do when it comes to sanctioned tournaments is store credit and things like that, which to a degree is fine. However, I just feel like that's more of a local tournament prize support. Now, what do I mean by local tournament? Okay, when it came to Magic the Gathering, you have the highest level, which is what they call the Mythic Championship now, but I've always known it as the Pro Tour. 
And then you have the next step down from that being the Grand Prix, or in this case, when it comes to Magic, they call them Magic Fest now. Don't even get me started on these names, they're dumb. Okay, so you have the Grand Prix or GP levels, and then you have, you know, nationals, states, regionals, and then locals. Okay, so local tournaments is pretty much anywhere from like 8 to 16 people. I've seen it as high as 60 at certain places, but that's just because it can accommodate that size. You know, where it's everybody in the local area, they spend 5 bucks to get into this tournament. And your prize support can be anywhere for a few packs down to a single pack. And usually if you just entered, you usually get a small little constellation prize just for entering. Uh, just depending on the size, really. And depending on how much prize support there have been allotted from the play network. Okay, that's one of the things I've seen when it comes to in-person competitions that we have a major lack of that. Where people can just have local little tournaments and have small surprise support because it's a local thing. You don't need to have this huge surprise support. You know, and what I view BOSS as, if, and of course, if you guys don't understand what the acronym of BOSS is, it's the Battle of Supreme Swag. Don't get me on started on why they call it that. That's just what they call it. To me, that's the GP level of competition, okay? It's where anyone can enter in, and yes, there's a level of travel because they have them in local area or have them spread out throughout the world. And then, of course, you have the highest level, which in terms of gloving, which would be IGC. That's currently on hiatus, but it's here, neither here nor there. That's pretty much the proto level of gloving, in my opinion. You know, there's there's so much that can be done in terms of sanctioned tournaments that I just don't feel like that should be included on this episode. I feel like that should be its own episode altogether. You know, that's one of the major cons is big travel uh it's just it can get very very expensive especially if you're somebody who lives on the east coast and they're having one on the west coast and you have to travel across the country you know another major con that i think a lot of people would say is just the the space constraints and time constraints that tend to happen when it comes to in-person competitions which is highly true However, that's just one of those things that you're going to have to take your lumps with because not every tournament runs so perfectly that you can never have a problem arise. You know, problems will always arise. And to some people, I th they can probably see the con of it being much faster being a, a problem because you're only hanging out with these people with about four to five hours and then everyone disperses. However, I don't think that should be something that everyone should be so down on. If you actually take the opportunity to connect with people, especially if they're in your local area, then now you actually have opportunities to meet up with people, lab with them, whatever the case may be. So there, there's a lot of differences between online and in-person. And when it comes to preferences, I will certainly say in-person competitions will always be paramount in my opinion, just because you get so much more of the experience in person than online. Uh, I, I feel, you know, the, the lack of human interaction in person when it comes to online stuff really hampers on it. You know, so it all depends on how you want to take it. If you're somebody who just doesn't want to spend the money for the travel to actually go to a in-person competition, online competitions are your perfect substitute for that. You know, and that's just something that you want to keep in mind. At least in my opinion, that's something that I would always keep in mind because I'm a person who just doesn't have the money who can just travel around willy-nilly all the time. So if I wanted to do competitions, online competitions would probably be a great start. I would certainly say to somebody who's never started in competitions before that I would say start with online competitions to kind of get your feet wet of how the competition format works. And then eventually move up to the in-person competitions. I will certainly say that I will even give it a try eventually, that I will try, and you should try, to go into an in-person competition. Because there's the experience that happened with in-person competitions, I don't think you can get anywhere else. Um, it's, in terms of gloving, yes, you can probably emulate the same effect by going to just regular venues and events like that. However, I just feel like in terms of competitions, there's something that venues cannot provide, and that is a room full of like-minded people. You know, if you go to an event, you'll find a crowd of people that are like-minded than you. 
but when you go to an event that everybody's there who has the same thought process as you and the same passions as you, there's nothing that compares to it. So I always highly recommend people at least try to go to one in-person competition just to get the feeling and the experience because like I tell a lot of people, especially not even in gloving, but outside of gloving, it's not about winning or losing. It's about becoming a better person, win or lose. Okay. But of course, that's something I would probably have to put in a different episode and not let this episode drag out too long. I'm actually pretty much pushing that envelope right now. So this is pretty much the end of my episode. I really hope you guys enjoyed all the content that I have been writing for you. I really hope that this information really helps you understand what it is in competition that they're looking for and understand what you need to be focusing on. Now, I will still disclaim that yes, I don't have very much experience in gloving competitions. However, my experiences in other competition settings do help me understand what I need to understand in this competition. So if you have previous experience in other competitions, I would love to hear about it. If you've done dancing, if you play Magic Gathering, if you've done Smash Brothers, if you've done any of the esports stuff, I would like to know what it is that you've done and how do you feel that will help you with gloving competitions of course there's various platforms that you can hit me up of course you can hit me up at the facebook page which is aptly named the gloving paradigm you can also hit me up at my email as a private chat at muttonchopguy@gmail.com. you can also hit me up at reddit which is the username muttonchopguy and of course you can get onto my discord server which will be linked in this episode description below you can find all that information there and you can always hit me up there. Do never, never ever hesitate to contact me. I usually have Tuesday through Friday off, so you can always hit me up during those times and I'll be fully available to talk to you on anything. But that is pretty much all for my episode. I really hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you for everybody who has commented on some of the questions I've asked. I didn't get a whole lot of responses on this particular topic, but that's totally fine because you know it to each its own in terms of their opinions on what competition is to them so that is all for my episode i am your host peter aka lpda dubuque and i'll see you guys all next week